How many people are open and transparent about the worst mistakes they've made in their lives? And let's be realistic about it. I think for me, that's why I think it's a shame that it's becoming such a long-winded inquiry because the learning is all there today. You don't need four years to plough through it. And if we know what the learning is today, we can start to do something about it rather than wait. The worst mistakes of our lives. That's quite a strong statement. But in the face of major disasters, it is perhaps inevitable. There will be missteps. It's good to be able to... I hope, be humble enough to reflect and say, actually, we, you know, we can learn from some, some of this stuff mm. in the future. And when the dust settles, people will be asked to account for their actions. We want to get to the truth. We want to understand what happened, so why certain decisions were taken, uh, by whom. And primarily, we want to save lives in future. The inquiry has just begun but many people feel they are still waiting too long for answers. And as a journalist, it's my job to challenge those in authority. Um, What do you think has been worse for the economy, though, COVID or that budget? Even if at times these questions might make people feel uncomfortable. I think it was very stressful, not for me, but for for, for others and, and myself. But I think there was very swift action. I was sacked. The Prime Minister, I think, left within a week. Having moments where you step back can provide insight. How's history going to judge the government in terms of their response to COVID? I think people will say that the, the government did its best, but I think there was, there was also a lot of muddle and confusion. This question is most critical when much of the collateral damage seems to have fallen on the most vulnerable in society. And there was a moment when we could have grabbed it and said, OK, we're going to do the best we can for our children. And we just fell away. Because sometimes there's no time to wait. We literally just fell away and didn't meet the challenge. You're listening to the Lockdown Files podcast from The Telegraph. Episode 5, The Fallout. Closing schools during COVID was the biggest disruption to children's education since the Second World War. When we got hold of Matt Hancock's WhatsApps, my colleague Hayley Dixon started to piece together the debate around school closures. And what she found was unsettling. Here's Hayley back in that hot, sweaty room we used to go through the messages. It will make a lot of parents um, and children who've missed out on on almost a year's worth of education very angry to see that they were joking about this um, behind people's backs. In late December 2020, Sir Gavin Williamson, the then Education Secretary, was fighting to keep schools open. And yet... Behind the scenes, while he's making these arguments, Matt Hancock is talking with his advisers and with other ministers, and he really seems to be ridiculing him. Matt Hancock said that he was having to turn the volume down and just generally taking the mickey out of Gavin. It doesn't seem like Hancock wants to even listen to Williamson's argument. And there's also evidence, some evidence that Matt Hancock is trying to go behind these meetings in which they're discussing schools opening, in which ministers were really trying to keep schools open um, and create what he calls as a rearguard action in which he's trying to persuade people that the action on schools need to be tougher. This rearguard action appeared successful. On the 4th of January 2021, most of England's primary schools did reopen, but only for one day. Gavin Williamson might have lost the fight, but his efforts weren't unnoticed. So if you were to ask me in that December, January, did the Department for Education fight to keep schools open? From everything I know, yes, they did. And I'm actually grateful to the Secretary of State and senior officials for for the efforts they made. That's Amanda Spielman, Chief Inspector at Ofsted. That's the organisation which evaluates schools. She's speaking to my colleague, Janet. And especially it is fashionable to um, to give Gavin no credit for anything. And he he did fight. Almost everyone we speak to for this podcast identifies closing schools as one of the biggest errors of the pandemic. At what stage did you think, actually, that was a mistake? Was it when you became education secretary? No, when I was a parent at home. Fair enough. And the house was on tender hooks. I don't ever want schools to close again. Do you think it was justified to close the schools as well, as long as we did? 
Well, no. I mean, the first, for the lot, first lockdown, yes, because of the ignorance, but I think it was a dreadful thing to, to do it beyond that. It was just appalling, actually. When the wrong decisions are made, the consequences can be very long-lasting. This is something Liz and her 10-year-old daughter Amber, who you met in episode four, know all too well. She wants to go to school. That's what she wants. More than anything in the world, she wants to be like everybody else and go to school and just fade into the background. You know, that's all she wants. Growing up, Amber's autism meant she sometimes missed school when the usual schedule was upended. Like in the lead up to Christmas when... They're doing carol singing and Santa comes in and... So if you're a child that... Just before lockdown, she was going in nearly every day. But now... Her current attendance is something like 62% and obviously rapidly declining. Liz knows just how hard her daughter is trying. If we get as far as leaving the house, she just freezes. It's like an anxiety takes over. One, one day, the day you're talking... One day, it got so bad that Amber found herself completely stuck. I think she knows that, that once she comes in, that's kind of her giving up. So she just lay prone on the driveway for about an hour and a half until I said, look, I'm making the decision, you know, I'm making the decision that you're not going to school. It's not you, you're not making the decision, I'm doing it. It's like Amber is paralysed. All Liz can do is sit with her. Because she can't... She can't move. Amber isn't alone. Almost a quarter of children in England are now persistently absent. It means they're missing the equivalent of one school day every fortnight, at least. It's just one example of the collateral damage, the fallout of repeated school closures. In February 2021, Boris Johnson put Sir Kevin Collins in charge of solving this crisis in education. My colleague Catherine tracked him down. You're referred to as the catch-up czar. Is that a fair summary of your... Not really. I, I never like... I don't like either catch-up or czar, to be honest with you. <laughs> so we, we managed to get it to a uh, sort of education recovery commissioner. When he first met with the then Prime Minister... I was struck by the ambition to really respond to this and to do everything we could. And, and, and the initial charge to me was, what would it take to recover... Um, in this parliament for our children. So there was a sort of three-year window. What would it take to recover the loss? For Collins, the race was on. Children in England had lost up to 110 classroom days. He felt there was only one way to make this right. Students needed to get back as many of the hours they'd lost during the pandemic as possible. He drew up a plan based around what he called the three T's. Training, tutoring... And then the third T, and this was the one that uh, was problematic in the end, was time. I wanted to increase the time children spent at school um, for, for two things. Firstly, so that you could, you could go back to the rich and broad experiences, the sport, the drama, the choir, all the things that are really matter in building social skills that had been dropped off. We need to find more time to do more of that. Uh, but we also need to find time to do the tutoring, because you don't want tutoring to be done instead of a good English lesson. It's as well as or pull you out of a PE lesson to do tutoring, because then you're narrowing the curriculum again. So we wanted time. But as the saying goes, time is money. Collins's plan would have cost the government £15 billion. And when ministers announced their catch-up scheme at the start of June 2021, his proposed extension to the school day was nowhere to be seen. Collins recalls when they broke the news to him. And then I, at that meeting, very clearly said, you're making a huge mistake. Who was in that meeting? Prime Minister, Chancellor and Secretary for Education. And what did you say to them? I kind of, I knew that it was, so I had something prepared and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, you're making a huge error. You're basically a lot of... He looked the assembled ministers straight in the eyes and said... This is the biggest disruption in education that a generation of children have faced and we have a responsibility as adults at this moment and we are failing our children. And then he quit. Nadim Zahawi replaced Gavin Williamson as Education Secretary in September 2021. So he helped implement this watered-down plan. When we met, he told me... I know Kevin Collins, I've got a lot of time for him. When I looked at the evidence, 
my very strong view was, look, let's, we were about to spend five billion on catch up. Big part of that was going into uh, the national tutoring program. He gave some insight into why the government rejected Collins's full proposal. Let's look at the evidence, right? After you've spent the five billion, let's look at where we are in terms of have, have those children uh, been able to catch up? Uh, and then I was completely open to going further mm. if we needed to. But for Collins, no delay was acceptable. This is the chance. This is the moment. And we're failing. And it's a mistake. Zahawi dismisses the so-called catch-up czar for... Getting stuck on arguing about whether it should be 15 billion or 5 billion. But Collins said he knew the difference all those billions would have made. There was a moment when we could have grabbed it and said, OK, we're going to do the best we can for our children. And we just fell away. We literally just fell away and didn't meet the challenge, in my view. And that's a, that's a kind of lasting shame. What's worth pointing out here is during the pandemic, government spending in other areas was massive. My colleague Catherine caught up with Lord Theo Agnew, minister in charge of fraud. At least, he was until... Given that I'm the Minister for Counter-Fraud, it feels somewhat dishonest to stay on in that role if I'm incapable of doing it properly, let alone defending the, the, our track record. It is that it's for this reason that I've sadly decided to tender my resignation as a Minister across the Treasury and Cabinet Office with immediate effect. Just like Sir Kevin Collins, Agnew resigned in protest. As he saw it, the Treasury's COVID support schemes had left the public purse leaking like a sieve. Early on in his career, he worked in debt collection, so he's used to catching crooks. I understand the fraudulent mind, and we left ourselves wide open. In April 2020, Agnew tried to get the Treasury ministers to build in some basic anti-money laundering checks into the bounce-back loan scheme. I had some real rows with them, but they wouldn't listen. Why wouldn't they listen? Because they were spooked. They th basically, the mantra was, we will see the productive capacity of the economy destroyed unless we get this money out the door tomorrow. To which I said, this will hardly, it might delay it a day to do these extra checks, but it ain't going to make a, a, a material difference. And you will be giving money to bad people. Prior to taking up the education portfolio in September 2021, Nadim Zahawi was a junior minister in the business department. I put to him the kind of egregious examples of pandemic fraud that Agnew rails against. It seems that in some cases, some individuals took out, you know, 10, 20 of these bounce back loans. There's a point where it starts to look crazy. Yeah. We, we, and, and that's where he, he's got a point. I, we were moving at speed. But there's certainly lessons to, to learn. Yeah. And I would say, you know, we would be um, unwise to, to, to simply just brush that off and say, no, uh, everything. It wasn't. You know, mm. We could have done better. I think it's better to say, actually, you know, we will learn from the, that, that particular episode and, get, and, and do better next time. Hopefully there isn't a next time with another virus. Uh, but in an emergency, um, uh, maybe an economic one, we, where we would actually, you know, exercise more rigor as to how we do these things. Here, he admitted that the government could have done better. But when it comes to the school catch-up programme, his apparent commitment to fiscal responsibility rings slightly hollow. After all, according to Lord Agnew, his department had essentially looked on as criminals exploited COVID schemes. Official figures show the public purse was defrauded of £7.3 billion. That's enough to fund Sir Kevin Collins's catch-up programme for a year and a half. Today's operation is to do with a bounce-back loan fraud. I fraudulently obtained a £50,000 loan uh, by claiming that he's a landscape gardener. People suspected of illegally claiming tens of thousands of pounds from the government's bounce-back loan scheme. The amount of money lost to fraud is something many of our interviewees acknowledge as a problem. It's something that seems to plague Lord Agnew. It's just heartbreaking. And so that's why this whole waste in government gets me so wound up. Having retired from his ministerial post, Agnew tells Catherine that he's back running the Academy Trust he founded 10 years ago. But this gives him no respite. 
every day he's confronted with the fallout of the government's COVID policies. These children have been de-socialised. I mean, we have an epidemic of what's called persistent absence in schools. These are children who are refusers to go. An epidemic of school refusal. Children struggling, just like Amber. We're sending vans and buses around to get these kids, and the parents are saying he, he or she won't leave her bedroom. And he says... I get frustrated because we're so short of money in the school system at the moment, and I see this money being banded about when I, would, I want to help those kids who are persistently absent. Because if they don't get back into school in the next year or so, they're lost to education and they're done. For the most vulnerable pupils, closing schools meant... The loss of the line of sight uh, for children in difficult family circumstances, whether they've been recognised or even more, actually, when they've not yet been recognised. That's Ofsted's Amanda Spielman again. Teachers' eyes on children to spot when things are going wrong are really, really important. And some of the awful things we know about that happened during lockdown, um, I'm quite sure if there'd been more eyes on those children, some of them, not all of them, but some of them might have been averted. That's coming up in the second half. Lockdown was meant to keep people safe. But for children living in abusive families, home was the most dangerous place they could be. When schools closed in March 2020, vulnerable children or those with key worker parents were allowed to keep going into classrooms. But this didn't always happen. My colleague Sophie found a case which demonstrates this issue really clearly. I'll let her tell you about it. Back in January, I came across this story in a paper. The headline was, Convicted paedophile given custody of girl he got pregnant after years of horrific abuse. Reading the article, I realised that the young girl, given the pseudonym Ruby, would likely have been desperately trying to get help while the country was in lockdown. I did some research and read the serious case review. It was carried out by the Independent Children's Safeguarding Partnership in Leeds. I learned that before the pandemic, a man called Matthew not his real name, had been granted custody of Ruby and her three younger siblings, despite being a registered sex offender. He had served a prison sentence for sexually abusing young boys when he was a teenager. To understand why no one acted sooner to protect Ruby and her siblings, Sophie tracked down the chair of the safeguarding panel who investigated her case. My name is Jasmine de Sanguera and I am the independent safeguarding chair for the Lee's Children's Partnership. Basically, when children are harmed in Leeds, it's Sangera's job to investigate why this happened. The question of how a registered sex offender could be given full custody of children is one that really made me not sleep at night. It's one of those things that, and that's the question, isn't it? But what we have to remember is this was approved by a court in England. But that court is going to be informed through reports. In these reports, Matthew was assessed by various professionals. Inexplicably, despite his criminal history, at no point did they check the sexual abuse risk he posed to his adopted children. In these reports, Matthew was reviewed by various professionals. Inexplicably, despite his criminal history, the sexual abuse risk he posed to Ruby was never adequately assessed. For Ruby, a young teen, trapped at home with her abuser, lockdown was a perfect storm. So this review would respectfully, I would respectfully say, you know, whether enough consideration was given during lockdown to the possible increased risk of Matthew reoffending, given that he's now at home with children who are not allowed to leave the house. In her expert opinion, the COVID pandemic was detrimental to Ruby as it reduced her opportunities to disclose her abuse, whilst simultaneously affording Matthew privacy. So a month after the UK had entered lockdown, Ruby ran away from home, ending up on a stranger's doorstep, asking for help. Despite the neighbour calling the police to tell them about Ruby's escape attempt, no officer followed this up. And nearly a year later, Ruby had become pregnant and sought out an abortion. When she went to the doctor's, with her guardian, she basically told the story that 
I have been sleeping with a boy of my same age, etc. The GP was very concerned. He, Because Ruby was underage, the authorities were alerted. One police officer had a feeling that something wasn't right and arranged for paternity testing. It turned out that she had experienced repeated serious sexual abuse over a period of a number of years and the child that she was carrying was genetically tested. Who was the father? It was her guardian, Matthew. I asked Sangera if she felt the government had thought hard enough about what would happen to society's most vulnerable young people once they'd been locked down. No, I don't. I don't think they considered that in terms of the impact on those living in households where they were known to services, but equally those who are yet to be identified by services. And that's a key point with this case. Ruby was classed as vulnerable, so she should have been at school throughout lockdown under the government's guidance. But it seems that nobody was asking why she wasn't there. She just fell through the cracks. Schools are the eyes and ears of child protection, of, you know, being able to identify children that may be at risk. And teachers comprise one of the largest reporters of child abuse. So the fact that Ruby herself was hoping that somebody would see or hear her, you know, she attempted to run away from home. I I absolutely believe that if she were in school, she would have spoken to somebody and that would have absolutely helped. Sangera saw the fallout of what she sees as the government's mismatched priorities among the vulnerable children she assessed. From her point of view, ministers appeared to place more importance on COVID rules than the welfare of at-risk youth. This is a horrifying trend that Sophie picked up on. She read dozens of serious case reviews into children who had died or been seriously harmed during the pandemic. When I began to investigate, I discovered reviews across the country which found that abusers used lockdown as an excuse to isolate vulnerable children. Parents would keep their children out of sight, claiming they were concerned about the family catching the virus. Social workers couldn't get beyond the doorsteps of these homes. They were forced to check in on families using Zoom and struggled to spot the usual telltale signs of abuse. Now that hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And I do think COVID restrictions did take precedent over keeping children safe, actually. When our own children are saying, I wish somebody had seen me on my own because I would have said something, what they're saying is that's a cry for help. Because Ruby was at home, there were fewer chances for other people to raise the alarm, fewer chances for her to tell someone what was happening fewer chances for the agencies working with Matthew to spot that he posed a risk. This is a really extreme case, but the independent safeguarding review found that Ruby suffered more as a result of national COVID policies brought in to reassure people of their safety. And as the Children's Commissioner, Dame Rachel D'Souza, told my colleague Catherine, when it comes to very vulnerable children... No failure rate's acceptable. Right. The cost of failure is so high. So to me, that support for those children needs to be you know, absolutely prioritised. The collateral damage that repeated stay at home orders inflicted on the country is so great that many people are now asking, was there another way? Was locking down the biggest mistake of all? I sat down with Kwasi Kwarteng. During the pandemic, he was... Minister of State for Energy, I was Secretary of State for Bayes. Bayes. That's the former business department. Kwarteng is of course best known for his chaotic 38-day stint as Chancellor. More on that in a minute. But when I asked him to pass judgment on the government's decision to lock down, he was pretty reflective. The test of this is if this were to happen again, would the same response occur? And I don't think it would. I think we would try and keep things open for longer and actually you know, deal with the threat of the, the virus but in a less in a less draconian way. We would try and isolate and be and be be more strategic and focused about how we dealt with it. I'm going to interrupt the former Chancellor here, because the point he's making is worthy of explanation. Kwarteng appears to be advocating for an anti-lockdown approach to managing COVID. 
which recommended isolating the vulnerable instead of locking down. It was never implemented in the UK. And another former Conservative minister, Robert Buckland, gave my colleague Sophie some context as to why. I don't think that we have much of a luxury of choice but to do the same. I think there are huge drawbacks to lockdowns. I don't like them. Uh, I think what happened with schools was a was a real problem. But you tell me what else we could have done in the circumstances. He adds, I would say without enthusiasm, you know, I, I thought that the lockdown was probably the only option we could have taken at that time. Was that the first lockdown or the second lockdown or both lockdowns? First lockdown. I think the second lockdown was more moot. But again, bearing in mind the alarming number of rising cases, I think that, and it was midwinter, if you remember, I think that it was sensible to do that. He acknowledges that it's easy to say these things with hindsight. But he stresses... I think the economic impact was very great. There's no doubt. Do you think it's too much? Well, I mean, how much is too much? People will say, well, you know, we were saving lives. But I, I think I think it's had a massive impact. And I think I don't think it would happen. The response would be the same. Whoever's in power, I don't think the response would be the same. Because now we know the consequences of... Yeah, and I think, you know, you look at the economic aspect of it, the, you know, the debt that we're in, the fact that taxes have had to go up to pay for that those debts, uh, the fact that, you know, we're not growing very fast. Later on in the interview... He added, So I think the impacts of it have been colossal. And uh, I'm not sure that a government would want to go through that again. Of course, there is an elephant in the room. Um, What do you think has been worse for the economy, though, COVID or that budget? The budget was reversed within about two weeks. um, And the interest rates were going up anyway and have gone up in the seven months since. Yeah. So so I think there was a short term impact. I think it was very stressful. Yeah, um, and and, and not, no, not for me, but for, for, for others and, and myself. But I think there was very swift action. I was sacked. The prime minister, I think, left within a week. And all the... the, the uh, it's crazy, actually. The, all, yeah, it was extraordinary. And all the, um, the measures in it were reversed. Um, so to keep harping back onto it, I think, is, is not very constructive. I don't, I don't actually think it, it makes sense. I think we've got to look at what the, the last budget was... We've got to look at where interest rates are now. Um, and a lot of that, as um, a lot of the effects of the mini budget, were reversed very quickly. On the 27th of June, when Matt Hancock was giving evidence to the COVID inquiry, Jean Adamson was sitting in the public gallery. Jean is a member of the UK COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice campaign group. It's been quite sombre, I would say, yes. Is it quite quiet there? Very quiet, and I mean, you'd expect that in a courtroom anyway, but I think the mood is sombre. Good morning, my lady. Matt Hancock, MP, please. She tells me that in the hearing room there were... A few photographs of our loved ones so that people will not forget that this is what this is about. It's about our loved one that we've lost. Her journey to that courtroom had begun just over three years and two months earlier. I always remember the day he rang, the GP he rang. It was um, Maundy Thursday because it was the day before Good Friday 2020. Her father, Cleo, a former London underground worker, was in a care home. We think your dad has COVID and there were several other cases in the care home anyway. So, you know, they were really dropping like flies at the time. I went in every day over the Easter weekend, Good Friday, Saturday, Easter Sunday. Um, I I could only speak to him at the window, though. I couldn't go in. Um, So I, I was, well... That, that was that was the only way that I could could reach him. But you know, it's heartbreaking that as he lay there on his deathbed, that I wasn't able to just hold his hand or you know reach out and comfort him in any way. Um, yeah, it, it's something that will I'll live with, you know, haunt me for the rest of my life, really. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. It must be terrible, really painful. You only get one chance to say goodbye, don't you? 
Jean knows there are some things she can never get back, and she fears the inquiry will fail to take sufficient account of COVID's victims. Do you feel marginalised? Oh yes, we do. We absolutely do. Yes, we felt that way for some time and our pleas have fallen on deaf ears so far. The safeguarding expert in Ruby's case, Jasvinda Sangera, said Baroness Hallett should listen to those that were directly impacted by COVID due to vulnerability. So Ruby's voice would be a good one. You know, where are the other children? When the inquiry's draft terms of reference were initially published last year, the words child and children were missing entirely, and a date for this module still hasn't been set. The, the, the pages and pages in the <laughs> Telegraph... Jaw-dropping. The, um, the leaked yeah. WhatsApp uh, messages. Quite surprising, isn't it? I do recall... Um, reading some of that uh, report there Um, and Matt Hancock essentially not accepting the advice that came from Chris Whitty at the time because he said it would muddy the waters. That's Jean again. They're very fond of saying, you know, repeating that mantra, oh, the science, the science, you know, we went with the science. But they didn't always go with the science. When we published the revelations from Matt Hancock's WhatsApp messages, it gave people like Jean insight into some of the government's decisions, which had changed their lives forever. But there are still big gaps in the timeline. And the COVID inquiry is committed to filling them. But to do this, they need to see Boris Johnson's messages. Uh, Just some breaking news to bring you coming into us here at BBC News right now. The Cabinet Office has now lost its legal challenge to the UK COVID inquiry chairwoman's request. Uh, You'll know she has been requesting Boris Johnson, then Prime Minister, asking for his unredacted WhatsApp messages, notebooks and diaries. The government have to release them unredacted to the chair of the COVID inquiry. So that's a real victory for us. Um, So we can get to the truth. um, And we want to save lives in future. And we want to obviously learn lessons. It's a big victory for the inquiry, as well as Jean's group. But the story of Boris Johnson's messages hasn't come to an end yet. Because as we're writing this episode, the COVID inquiry still hasn't been able to access all the messages. Let's go back to Jean on that Tuesday morning in late June. It's just gone 10am and Matt Hancock is being sworn in. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly truly declare declare and affirm. But as the former health secretary was on pandemic preparedness, Jean said she became increasingly frustrated. His attitude was, I mean, quite glib, I would say, in his his responses. The responsibility for ensuring preparedness in social care formally fell to local authorities and there was work required of local authorities to put in place pandemic preparedness plans. You know, essentially, what was being put to him, he was kind of defending it and saying, well, you know, basically it wasn't his fault. Um, There's quite a lot of that. Well, it was the local authorities that were supposed to have a plan for a pandemic. What was the name of your department? The, I've, come, I've already talked about this. It was, it's the Department of Health and Social Care, and yet the legal responsibilities are with local authorities. Oh, well, that wasn't us. Um, that strategy, well, I inherited that. There was a lot of defensiveness, it's not my fault stuff going on with him. So, again, very disappointing. But once his testimony was over, something bizarre happened. He seemed to want to come over and apologise to us. You know, he came over and we are, we're not ready to hear that from him. You know, we just turned our back on oh, him. Oh, did you? Yes. Yeah. So... Yeah, it was. Uh, I was mortified. You know, he was just like a few inches from from me, and I was, you know, what's he doing here? Mm. You know, um, yes, it was just really inappropriate. You know, but it, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't well received. 
We asked Matt Hancock if he wanted to come on the podcast. He turned us down. Instead, we received a statement from a spokesperson which said, open quotes, The stolen materials published by The Telegraph have been taken completely out of context and many of the stories written from them are wildly inaccurate. All Mr Hancock's messages had already gone to the COVID inquiry unredacted, which is the right place to learn lessons of the pandemic, end quotes. For the Lockdown Files team at The Telegraph, once we published our initial stories from Hancock's WhatsApps, it was people like Jean that made us want to continue our investigations in this podcast. Because Jean and the hundreds of thousands of people like her who lost loved ones, those who suffered, deserve to know how decisions were made. And we don't think they should have to wait years to find out. Jean is going to keep attending the hearings. And as she watches the inquiry unfold, it's her dad she will be thinking of. He was a Windrush pioneer. So he came here from Barbados in the 1950s. My mum joined him here in London and, you know, they raised a family. And, yeah, I mean, he was a, a wonderful man, a very peaceful, contented, hard-working man, you know, believed in family and he's uh, dearly missed. For Jean, this is about doing right by her father. I'm passionate about this. And every day I wake up and... Um, You know, I think I remember my dad and why I'm doing this is to get justice for him. And and that's why all bereaved families, that's why we're here in this campaign, because we want justice for our loved ones. And that, that really is the bottom line. I'm Claire Newell, and this is the Lockdown Files podcast. Thank you for listening. And if you liked the series, please leave a five-star rating and a short review on Apple Podcasts. Please consider taking out a Telegraph subscription. We couldn't have made this show without our subscribers. Listeners to this podcast can get exclusive sign-up deals at telegraph.co.uk forward slash Lockdown Files podcast. And if you have any information to share, please email us on lockdownfiles at telegraph.co.uk. This episode is written by me, Janet Easton, with help from Adelaide Pogemont-Ponte and Jack Boswell. Adelaide Pogemont-Ponte is the series producer, with Janet Easton working as co-producer. The investigations team behind it are Catherine Rushton, Sophie Barnes and Janet Eastham. The other reporters who worked on the lockdown files are Robert Mendick, Haley Dixon, Tony Diver and Jack Leather. Sound design and mixing by Jack Boswell. The executive producer is Louisa Wells. Mm-hmm.